Chapter 3, The Gay Gender. Quote, As a child, the earning manifests an entirely unmistakable inclination towards girls' occupations, toward the company of girls, toward playing with girls' toys, especially dolls. How terribly lamentable to such a child that it is not the custom for boys to play with dolls, that Santa Claus will not bring him any, any dolls too, and that he is forbidden to play with his sister dolls. End quote. Even a cursory review of, of the science tells us that gays indeed are born that way. But there's an important caveat that the gay activists don't mention when trumpeting this good news. The science ties sexual orientation to gender, the sense of being masculine or feminine. Namely, gay men are shifted towards the feminine. Quote, What's striking is the large number of traits in which gay people's minds are at least partway shifted in gender atypical direction, end quote, according to Simon Vey, a neuroscientist whose own research on sexual orientation is often invoked by the born-that-way side. To put another way, even pro-gay researchers have found that under controlled experiments, some well-known stereotypes about effeminate gay men contain at least a, quote, kernel of truth, end quote. While confirmation of these stereotypes goes relatively unmentioned in most of the press, this gay effeminacy is foundational to the conclusion that gay men are born that way. The prevailing theory is simple, quote, Differences in levels of circulating sex hormones of the fetus, usually testosterone, during one or more critical periods of development cause the brain to develop in a more male-like or more female-like direction, and these differences influence a spectrum of gendered traits in juvenile life and adulthood, including the preference for male and female sex partners." End quote. More simply, prenatal hormones circulating in the mother's womb influence the sexual orientation of fetus. In the case of gays, the hormones make them more feminine. Their effeminacy and sexuality are tied together and flow from the same gender shift. Thus, if gay men are not feminine, there is no mechanism for them having been born that way. If gays don't acknowledge that gay is on average more effeminate, then they cannot insist they are born that way. One exception to the lack of interest in the details of what exactly gays are born with was a 60 Minutes piece in 2006 on the science of sexual orientation. Intrepid reporter Leslie Stahl profiled two sets of identical twins to illustrate the overlap of sexual orientation and gender traits. The first of two sets of twins. The bedrooms, quote, the bedrooms of nine-year-old twins Adam and Jared couldn't be more different. Jared's room is decked out with camouflage airplanes and military toys, while Adam's room sports a pastel can canopy, stuffed animals, and white horses. When Stahl came for a visit, Jared was eager to show her his G.I. Joe collection. I have ones that say uh, I have ones that say like Marine and SWAT, and that's where uh, that's where I keep all the guns for him. He explained. Adam was also proud to show off his toys. This one is one of my dolls, Brat's baby, he said. End quote. Adam's mannerisms matched his feminine interests. There was no difficulty telling which boy was more effeminate. But why is Leslie Stahl bothering small children whose gender and interests don't conform to societal expectation? expectations? Because childhood gender expression relates to adult sexual orientation in that the former predicts the latter. A feminine boy, more often than not, grows up to become a gay man. To prove this correlation, a group at Northwestern University, quote, recruited homosexual and heterosexual adults who had videos from their childhood, i.e. from ages 0 to 15 years, and we also videotaped them during an interview. Subsequently, we recruited homosexual and heterosexual adults to rate the degree of gender nonconformity from both the childhood and the adulthood video clips, end quote. The Raiders found that, quote, pre-homosexual children were significantly more gender nonconforming than pre-heterosexual children, end quote, and then these differences persisted into adulthood. Another study at UCLA followed two groups of boys, one feminine and the other unspecified. Of the feminine group, 75% were gay as adults, while none of the control group was gay. The other twins on the 60 Minutes program were Steve and Greg, two young adults. 
There, too, the gay twin was visibly more effeminate in both speech and dainty hand movements. These adulthood traits have evidence in research. To test the accuracy of the so-called gaydar, premised on the idea that gender traits distinguish gays, some members of the previously mentioned Northwestern University group did another study using videos, this time using only adults. Quote, We videotaped homosexual and heterosexual men and women answering an interview question about their interests. We then recruited two additional set of participants to rate various aspects of brief excerpts from these interviews. The first raters judged target sexual orientations from unedited videos and from partial information extracted from the videos. For example, video without sound for ratings of movement or sound without picture for ratings of speech. The result, 87% of the heterosexual targets and 75% of homosexual targets were judged, were accurately judged. In other words, people can pick up on non-sexual cues like movement, speech, and appearance to correctly assess whether someone is gay or not. According to a study at Tufts University, this assessment is accurately perceived in merely 50 milliseconds without even videos, but just photos showing faces. A New York University study found that computer-generated animations depicting human silhouettes, human silhouettes, effeminate swaying walks were judged to be homosexual. These differences are not just superficial mannerisms either, but are deep inside the brain. Within a part of the hypothalamus, which regulates male typical behaviors, exists a cell group that is larger in males than females. In humans, the sexually dimorphic region is called the INAH3. Simon LeVay's research has found that the size of INAH3 in gay men mirrors that of women, while straight men's are considerably larger than both. Similar findings in animal studies confirm this pattern in rats and sheep. Gay men perform worse than straight men at certain visuospatial tasks like mental rotation and targeting, while women and gay men use the same navigational strategies of nearby landmarks. The verbal fluency and memory of gay men exceeds that of other men, mirroring that of women. Science, though, is late to linking sexuality with gender expression. Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, the first openly gay man, argued in pamphlets starting in 1864 that, quote, an earning, his coinage for a gay male, is not a man but is a type of hermaphrodite, a man-woman with a sexual orientation of a woman, a third sex, end quote. Ulrichs used the Latin phrase anima morbris virili corpore inclusa, the soul of a woman in the body of a man, to sum up his theory. Quote, Distinct from the feminine persuasion of our sexual drive, we earnings have still another feminine trait in us which, so it seems to me, offers the most positive proof that nature developed the physical male germ in us, yet mentally the feminine one." End quote. These traits are so obvious, quote, one is forced to assume that these traits are congenital, end quote. Predating the current medical establishment by a century, Ulrichs noticed that this mental femininity was present in gay men from earliest childhood, as the opening epigraph bears witness. He says that, quote, the earning of voids, the company of boys, their occupations, their games, end quote. While today we know that feminine pre-gay boys are not homosocial, preferring the company of girls, contrary to most boys who are well aware of the dangers of cooties. Coming out to his family in a series of letters in 1862, he mentions that pre-gay boys do not like scuffling and throwing snowballs. Science now tells us pre-gay boys do not like rough and tumble play. A century before Ulrichs, Molly Houses existed in 18th century England, whose participants engaged in feminine behavior. A contemporary witness, quote, they rather fancy themselves as women, imitating all the little vanities that custom has reconciled to the female sex, affecting to speak, walk, tattle, curtsy, cry, scold, and to mimic all the manner of effeminacy that had ever fallen within their several observations. Historical example of possibly gay men include the Greek-Roman Kinidos and Kinidae, 
and Native American bur uh, burdashes. The former, were thought, the former were thought of as effeminate not just because they took the receptive role in anal sex, but because they were also feminine in dress and manner. The burdashes, like the kinaidos, were feminine in both ways and also had an element of spirituality. Both give credence to the idea that gays exist, of our cult uh, gays exist outside of our culture. Of course, there's nothing shocking about any of these. They merely confirm what most of us have instinctively suspected and experienced. In the interest of working with a common source accessible to all, can anyone find gay men on YouTube who are not at least somewhat effeminate? Or take a Canadian show called One Girl, Five Gays. With a rotating cast of about 20 gay men talking about love and sex, you think one would be masculine, but all exhibit varying degrees of, of effeminacy not generally seen in straight men. And 20? How many of them could have been Roman emperors? An effeminate boyfriend of mine could flirt with women better than any other man I've seen. So I asked him why he did not want to have sex with women. The response betrayed a feminine self-identity. Quote, ew, I'd feel like a lesbian, end quote. This explains the gay obsession with divas like Britney Spears, Cher, Madonna, and the like. Gay men identify with struggling women who overcome the odds because they often see themselves in a similar light. They often even use the feminine pronouns amongst each other, and as, as much the same happened in the Molly Houses in the 1700s and during Ulrich's time in 1864, quote, When earnings get together, they mostly give themselves nicknames. I suppose this is because they feel like women, even if, subcon if only subconsciously. For, ex for example, Laura, Georgina, instead of George, Mathilde, Madonna, Queen of the Night. They also call each other sister, for example, sister, sister dear. On the Born This Way blog, readers send in childhood photos with a descriptive anecdote. While the blog claims to be a, quote, photo essay project for gay adults of all genders, end quote, I have not come across a post that did not highlight childhood gender nonconformity. Most of those on the site say they knew they were gay at an early age, even before puberty. If gay is merely a sexual orientation, how did children know they were gay? Were they having sex? No, they remember being different in their mannerisms, interests, and habits. Dan Savage, a professional gay columnist and founder of the It Gets Better Project, and his husband adopted a son. In an interview with NPR, he described how he knew their son was straight. Uh, quoting from the article, uh, Miller and Savage are the fathers of a 13-year-old son named DJ. He's in the eighth grade, likes skateboarding, and has never been harassed for having gay parents. If anything, we joke, that, uh, that we're raising the kid who beat us up in grade school, says Savage. If he didn't have us for parents, he's a little thuggy snowboarder, skateboarder dude, and I like to think that he's blessed to have us as parents because you can see in him the capacity to be a bully. But he's sensitized to the issue from being, uh, from being from a different kind of family. End quote. Watching DJ grow up, he says, has made him realize just how much of a sexual, how much of sexual orientation is hardwired. Quote, uh, quoting Savage, from the time he was very young, I have been saying, "Oh, my son is straight because he is just straight," says Savage. Uh, quoting Sav Savage yet again, my mom, when she got over my being gay, admitted that she kind of thought all along that I was gay. I like to bake and I like to listen to musicals, and for my 13th birthday, I asked my parents for tickets to the Broadway tour of A Chorus Line. That's all I wanted. So I've always known that he's straight, end quote, uh, end quote of the article as well. Always known? Again, if you can tell a child's sexual orientation without any actual sexuality, you must be describing more than just sexual orientation. That's common sense. Some gays do acknowledge this, but the way in which they do reveals ambivalence towards full acceptance of the gender shift. Quote, uh, I am masculine, but at the same time still gay. End quote. Or so says the online dating profile of a guy who says he's an acrobat, but he has been, uh, who has been doing gymnastics since he was five. His picture shows an obviously gay man. Certainly not as gay as uh, unicorns farting out rainbows, but it's easy to spot the gayness even from still shots. 
Maybe there's a desire to be masculine or even in reality less, of, less effeminacy compared to other gay men, but even so there's an internal recognition that gay is a limiting factor for masculinity. Then there are others who are outright hostile to the idea of effeminacy despite their own effeminacy. And yet, with this overwhelming multitude of evidence, it's hard to bring this topic up. When referring, when referring to the lack of masculine gay men and asking where the real men were, an online poster to a gay forum was met with hostile remarks like, quote, It is difficult to reply to this thread and stay civil. You insult pretty much everyone with your post. There are a lot of masculine gay men out there. Sadly, there are also a few out there with the same attitude like you, end quote. Or sarcastic remarks like this. Quote, Could you provide a better example of what's for you the masculine super macho man as you surely are you're looking for? I mean, only to see who could possibly fit in that category. Sigh. End quote. A possible answer to this self-delusion from a gay man. Quote, Most of us grew up with our masculinity being called into question, and usually in a rather harsh and possibly violent manner. And most of us eventually stopped spending time with such people, and the ones we did hang out with didn't mention our femininity, partially because they didn't care and partially because they, perhaps instinctively, knew that it was a sore spot growing up, and perhaps it wasn't a good idea to dwell on that topic. So as time went on and people stopped mentioning our feminine ways, we grew to believe they didn't exist. Hey, nobody said anything, so, there's, uh, so they're not there, right? It's certainly easier on our still fragile ego to think we're 100% straight acting than it is to think that the thing we got bullied for as a kid is still visible for the world to see. End quote. Gay men set themselves backwards when they refuse to acknowledge their feminine traits. Not only do they undermine the idea that they are born that way, but they also shame themselves, especially the most visibly effeminate. There certainly is nothing wrong with effeminate, so why deny the obvious? Ulrich says gays ought to be true to themselves. Quote, Let us not be ashamed of our soft, emotional, feminine traits which nature gave us. Do not let us waste our energy by artificially adopting manly prerogatives." End quote. This is rather good advice. In fact, it's rather pathetic that gay men cannot acknowledge the self-evident truth when the first gay guy could two centuries ago. Not only do gay men set themselves back, uh, back when they refuse to acknowledge the obvious, this self-denial has harmed Greros the worst. While there have been efforts at infusing masculinity into, into the same-sex debate since the late 19th century, there hasn't been a word to fully define the love between fully real men, or at least one that has stuck around. The love between men is grudgingly tolerated for men who are that way, varying degrees of effeminate. The masculine are left out. By embracing their effeminacy, gay men foster greater tolerance for themselves while allowing Grero to not be associated with it. Of course, there's nothing wrong with effeminacy itself, but you won't compliment a woman on her mustache either. Same with Grero. Masculine men are much less likely to acknowledge their attractions if those are said to only occur with what they, uh, are, with what they are not, effeminacy. It's better for both of us to acknowledge these facts. The first of the two politically correct gay the first of the two politically correct gay dogmas states that gay men are no different from other men except in their sexuality. This is refuted by the science we have just reviewed. Gay men are different; they are gender shifted towards the feminine. While working in the right direction concerning gay gender, the current scientific mainstream is at fault for upholding the second day gay dogma that males, liking males, is a small minority. Maybe 2%, maybe even 10%, but definitely not more than the off-sided 10%. Our Greco-Roman colleagues beg to disagree with such low figures, and so does the overlooked mathematical, scientific, historical, and anthropological evidence sampled in the next chapters. <laughs>